Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Boa tarde a todos. My name is Carlos Almada, professor at the University of Federal of Rio de Janeiro and leader of MUSMAPS Research Group. My name is Carlos Almada, professor da da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro and leader do grupo de pesquisa MUSMAPS. And I'm my colleagues of MUSMAPS, Liduino Pitomeira, Hugo Carvalho, Daniel Moreira. We are very proud to open the fifth international conference of music and mathematics, MUSMAT 2020, for the first time in a online format. Eu e meus colegas do MUSMAT, Daniel Moreira, Liduino Pitoneira, Hugo Carvalho, estamos very, muito orgulhosos de abrir o quinto congresso internacional Música Matemática MUSMAT 2020 pela primeira vez em um formato online. This year, we will have an extraordinary number of globally renowned guests who will present very interesting lectures, papers and discussions on this amazing field, namely the confluence of music and mathematics with approach with analytical, compositional and theoretic biases. Este ano, Nós teremos uma quantidade extraordinária de, de convidados internacionais é, altamente renomados que irão apresentar é, palestras muito interessantes, artigos, discussões, mesas redondas, nesse campo é, extraordinário, fantástico, que é a confluência de música e matemática, com diversas abordagens composicionais, analíticas e teóricas. Five concerts with different instrumentation to close the five days of the Congress, presenting several premiums. Cinco concertos com diferentes instrumentações vão fechar os cinco dias do, do Congresso, apresentando diversas estreias. As I have, have been doing in the opening of our conference for the last four years, I would like to begin my presentation with a very brief historical overview covering the strong links of affinity, the closely associated the two areas. Como eu tenho feito nos últimos quatro anos da abertura do nosso congresso, eu gostaria de começar minha apresentação com uma, uma breve painel histórico sobre essa, esses, essas, essas fortes conexões de afinidade, essas, conexões, essas ligações de afinidade que associam as duas áreas, música e matemática. Um, well, this can be traced, traced back to about 600 years BC, with Pythagoras' reflections about the proportion between sounds and integers. This led him to use these relations for explaining the cosmos organization, a concept known as music of the spheres, as well as to inaugurate a theoretical tradition that would last almost 2,000 years and inspire the so-called musica speculativa. Isso, quer dizer, essas relações podem ser é, 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 ret, ret, é, ret, retrospectivamente traçadas é, por volta de 600 anos antes de Cristo com as com Pitágoras e suas reflexões sobre as proporções entre sons e números inteiros. Isso levou Pitágoras a, a usar essas relações para explicar a, a, a organização do cosmos, um conceito conhecido como a música das esferas, tanto, e também para inaugurar uma tradição teórica que iria durar pelo menos dois mil anos e inspirar a assim chamada música especulativa. Three centuries after Pythagoras, Aristoxenus wrote maybe the first treatise on music subjects. Three séculos depois de Pythagoras, aproximadamente, Aristoxeno escreveu talvez os primeiros tratados sobre assuntos musicais. Ptolemy, known normally as geographer, also formulated theories about sound. One of the most interesting of his writings proposes translate musical notes into mathematical equations and vice versa. Ptolomeu, conhecido normalmente como geógrafo, também formulou teorias sobre som. Uma das suas mais interessantes, dos mais interessantes escritos, propõe traduzir 
notas musicais em equações matemáticas e vice-versa. In the Middle Age, the first universities were created, inaugurating the era of scholastic knowledge. Among the disciplines lacked as essential for a solid formation, music, speculative music more properly, occupied an important post, integrating the quadrivium, at side of arithmetic, astronomy and geometry. Na Idade Média, as primeiras universidades foram criadas, eh, inaugurando a era do conhecimento escolástico. Entre as disciplinas ele, eh, elegidas como eleitas, como essenciais para a formação sólida de uma pessoa, a música, a música especulativa, mais propriamente, ocupou um importante posto, integrando o quadrívio ao lado de aritmética, eh, astronomia e geometria. Theoreticians like Boethius, inspired by, by translations of Greek and Roman treatises, propose new formulations, which provide the basis for subsequent music theory or modes, counterpoint, rhythm and method. Teóricos como Boethius, inspirados pelas tra por traduções de tratados gregos e romanos, e, eh, propu propuseram novas formulações que formaram as bases da música, da, da subsequente teoria musical, sobre modos, contraponto, ritmo e métrica. In the beginning of the second millennium, Guido d'Arezzo was one of the pioneers on musical notation. His clever invention, the Guidonian hand, can be seen as an elegant algebraic-like strategy for teaching and memorizing music. No começo do segundo milênio, Guido D'Arezzo foi um dos pioneiros na notação musical. Sua imaginativa invenção, a mão guidoniana, pode ser vista como uma estratégia elegante, algébrica, maneira algébrica, para ensinar e memorizar música. Um, the expansion of Pythagorean set of four first harmonic proportions, one, two, three, four, to six, by introduction of numerous, numero scenario by Zarlino, was maybe the most striking achievements of, in the music theory of the Cinquecento. His treatise, Instituzione Harmonica, has also plenty of other mathematics and acoustic formulations depicted in intricate graphic schemes. A expansão da, da, da série do, do grupo de quatro primeiros harmônicos, proporções harmônicas Pitágoras, 1, 2, 3, 4, para 6, pela introdução do número cenário, o Zarlino, foi talvez a mais impressionante é, é, aperfeiçoamento na teoria musical do, do Cinquecento. Seu tratado, Instituzione Harmonica, tem bastante outras formulações matemáticas e acústicas que são apresentadas em, em esquemas gráficos intrincados. Studies on toning systems made notable Vincenzo Galilei, father of Galileo, providing technological conditions for the construction of modern instruments. Estudos em sistemas de afinação tornou, tornaram Vincenzo Galileu, Galileu, Galilei perdão, notável. Ele é o pai do Galileu Galilei, fornecendo condições tecnológicas para a construção de instrumentos musicais modernos. The astronomer Johannes Kepler, famous for discovering the elliptic orbits of planets around the Sun, also dedicated some study on harmonic relations, which led him to elaborate the third law of planetary motion. O astrônomo Johannes Kepler famoso por descobrir as órbitas elípticas dos planetas em volta do Sol, também dedicou alguns dos seus estudos às relações harmônicas, que levaram ou levaram a elaborar a terceira lei dos movimentos planetários. Uh, this subject also stimulated French mathematician Marin Marcin Mersenne to write the histories Harmonie Universelle, que uh, compõe which comprised both theoretical and practical approaches. 
in a structure that would inspire some of the actors after Rameau's famous treatise on harmony. Uh, esse, esse mesmo assunto estimulou o matemático francês Marat Marsen a escrever seu Harmonia Universelle, que é, compunha tanto de, de abordagens teóricas quanto práticas, numa estrutura que se inspiraria, algumas décadas depois, o Ramon e seu famoso Tratado de Harmonia. Isaac Newton was also very interested in interactions of musical speculative principles and his theory on colors due to the same wave nature of light and sound. Isaac Newton também foi muito interessado nas interações eh, da, dos princípios da música eh, especulativa e sua teoria de co das cores devido às mesmas eh, a mesma natureza de som e luz. Another typical actor of the scientific revolution era Joseph Sauver, studied profoundly the mathematical and physical properties of sound, providing another dimension to Pythagoras and Zalino findings. Outro típico ator da revolução científica, Joseph Sauver, estudou profundamente as propriedades matemáticas e físicas do som fornecendo outra dimensão aos, às descobertas de Pitágoras e Zarnino. Euler was also a mathematician with profound interest in music. It can be evidenced by his proposal for a new musical theory, the idea for alterna alternative divisions of the octave by prime numbers, and especially for idealization of the tonics. Euler foi também um matemático com profundo interesse em música. Isso pode ser evidenciado pela sua proposta para uma nova teoria musical. A ideia de alternativas divisões da oitava por números primos, especialmente pela idealização da tonics. Modern acoustic theory is grounded in Fourier's discoveries about compound periodic waves. A acústica moderna, a teoria da acústica moderna, é fundamentada nas descobertas de Fourier sobre as ondas periódicas compostas. Uh, we cannot forget the extraordinary case of the mathematician Ada Lovelace, who launched the basis for algorithmic composition in the beginning of the 9th century. Nós não podemos esquecer do extraordinário caso da matemática Ada Lovelace que lançou as bases para a composição algorítmica no início do século XIX. And also the experiments of Helmholtz in the field of acoustics by incorporating the most advanced scientific results available in his time. E os experimentos de Hermann Helmholtz no campo da acústica através da incorporação dos mais avançados, avançados, perdão, é, recursos científicos disponíveis em seu tempo. In the 20th century, there is a sort of Cambrian explosion of mathematical approaches in, the, in music. This can be seen in the practice of composers like Schoenberg, Bartok, and Shanax. But especially uh, in the new theories, theories of end speculation with the help of computational resources as in the writings and the music of Milton Babbitt. Quer dizer, é, no século XX, uh, existe, é, aconteceu uma, uma espécie de explosão cambriana das abordagens matemáticas e música. Isso pode, pode ser visto na prática de compositores como Schoenberg, Bartok e Shanax. Mas, especialmente, em novas teorias e especulação, com a ajuda de... De, de recursos computacionais, como nos escritos e na música de Milton Babbitt. In, in the amazing experiments of David Cope, nos extraordinários experimentos de David Cope, uh, the cooperative relation between music and mathematics reached a new level with the pitch class set theory introduced by Alan Ford. As relações cooperativas entre música e matemática alcançam um novo nível 
com a teoria das, da classe de, de, de com conjunto de classes de alturas introduzida por Alan Ford and intensely popularized by Joseph Strauss book intensamente popularizada pelo livro de Joseph Strauss another landmark in this field is David Lewin's transformational theory which also gave birth to neo-Riemannian theory both branching in a multitude of approaches in the last years. Outra marca importante nesse campo é a teoria transformacional de David Lewin, que também deu fez nascer a, a teoria neo-Riemanniana. Ambas ramificando-se em uma grande quantidade de abordagens nos últimos anos. In 1980s, Robert Morris proposed a very influential formula Theory for Music Composition. Nos anos 80, Robert Morris propôs uma, uma teoria muito influente, eh, formal, para a composição musical. We must also remember Guerino Mazzola and his use of topos theory in music. Precisamos também lembrar da, da teoria topos na música de Guerino Mazzola. In the 21st century, we have also a lot of important publications concerning distinct aspects of musicmatics or metal music. For example, Tonal Pit Space by Fred Lerdo. No século XXI, nós também temos várias, muitas importantes publicações eh, referindo-se a diferentes aspectos de musicmática ou metal music. Por exemplo, Tonal Pit Space, de Fred Lerdo, or Audacious Elfony, by Richard Kong, in, among many and many others. Ou Audacious Elfony, de Richard Kong, entre muitos e muitos e muitos outros exemplos. Uh, well, this very compact time voyage brings us to now, this moment. Let me now introduce the dream team of international guests of our Congress. Here they are. Martin Rocamora, Moreno Andreata, Robert Peck, Dimitri Timotsko, Francois Pachet, Jean-Pierre Briot, David Templin, Scott Murphy, Fabian Moss, in, in, yes. <laughs> and now, the, our wonderful Brazilian guests. Carlos Matias, Marco Sampaio, Bruno Manziero, Arthur Campella, Hugo Carvalho, Ricardo Bordini, Marcelo Coelho, Rodolfo Coelho de Souza, Jonatas Manzoli, Francisco Aragão, Rodrigo Schramm e Petrúcio Piano. Um, and thank you for your attention. Enjoy the conference. Obrigado por sua atenção e aproveitem bastante a conferência. Um, let uh, I would okay, like to. Okay. Um, we have, we have uh, time. And, no. We have still around 10 minutes uh, ten minutes. before um, Professor Timoshko can make um, his yes. speech. Um, I can, uh, can uh, comment our program, maybe. Maybe you can you can comment uh, the programs around the week. Um, yes. If you want me to uh, to uh, put the slide with the programs, yes. You, uh, if you yes. stop sharing your slide first, I can I can share my slide. Stop sharing. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, that's the program for uh, for today. Yes. Well, in ten minutes we will have the lecture of Professor Dmitry Moscow. And sixteen, uh, we have uh, the roundtable algorithmic and music with Moreno Andreata, process and techniques of mathematical learning, how to teach. That's to music via computer science. Marco Sampaio, computational musicology algorithms and da data sets. 
and Jonathan Manzoli, Dialogue Between Composition and Analysis Through Computer Models, moderator Ludwin Kitombeira. And after this roundtable, we will have a concept, the first concept of our con Congress, Works for Clarinet, Solo Clarinet by Jose Batista Jr. Um, uh, may I, may I uh, talk about, uh, tell about uh, your second day or first, just this? Tomorrow, tomorrow we initiated the, 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 ses the, the day with a uh, round table, probability in music with David Temperley, um, Fabian Moss and Hugo Carvalho with my moderation. After this, we ha you have a section of communications with the works by Ricardo de Almeida Gonçalves, Denis Carvalho, José Fornari, Samuel Pereira, and Gilberto Bernardes. After this, we have a conference by Ricardo Bordini, um, homage to Jean-Marie Oliveira. And after this conference, we will have uh, the second concert, Works for Voice and Guitar, by the Dua Duch, the third day, Thursday. Round the table, number three, Logic and the Music, with Robert Peck, Petrucci Viano, and Francisco Aragon, moderated by Carlos Matias. We will have uh, uh, the first Newsmart panel, a discussion between um, students of postgraduate graduation in our university, members of a, of a research group in Newsmart, and a conference by Scott Murphy. And after this conference, our third concert works for Solo Bassoon by Ariane Petri. Um, fourth day, fourth day, round table number four, temporal organization in music with Carlos Matias, Arthur Campella, Marcelo Coelho, and this uh, round table is moderated by Daniel Moreira de Souza. Second, a Musmat panel. Uh, Carlos Almada, Liduino Quitombeira, Daniel Moreira de Souza, and Hugo Tremonte de Carvalho. With the, uh, our research, will be commenting in this, in this session. After this, a conference by Rodolfo Coelho de Souza, and our fourth concert, uh, Enlarge Your Sax, Works for Sax and Electronics by Pedro Bittencourt. And the last day, fifth round table, Music Signal Processing. Music Signal Process, sorry. Rodrigo Schramm, Martin Cocamora, Bruno Maziero, moderated by Luis Wagner Pereira Biscaini. Um, we'll have, after this, an open conversation with several um, researchers, very important in Brazil and, and uh, Mexico. Mexico. Uh, Gabriel Pareon, Marco Sampaio, Walter Neri, Guilherme Bertisolo, Julio Herlein, Ciro Visconti. Probably Almada just crashed. I will continue here. And uh, we have um, 6 p.m. a conference uh, by uh, Francois Pachet, Spotify, and Jean Pierre Briot, CNRS. They'll talk about uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence for music composition. And the last concert, Electroacoustics and the like. Um, that's a concert uh, of electroacoustic music. Okay, we have uh, five minutes before um, um, uh, Dr. Timoshko starts his speech. I will ask everybody to uh, stay with the mics off and uh, I will keep uh, this slide here. And um, 
3 p.m. Uh, we can start. I will now announce your uh, speech. Um, then you can start. Okay. So let's stay uh, mute for uh, five minutes. Hello. I'm back, you doing? Uh, no, please. Omar, I just continued the presentation for you. We are now in the, uh, the break, a five minute break, four minutes now. Uh, so I ask everybody to stay mute uh, before uh, uh, Dimitri Timoshko starts his speech. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question I've asked in chat. Thank you, okay. Okay, we invite now um, Carlos Almada to read, um, to present Professor Timoshko, who will make uh, his uh, keynote speech. Mm -hmm. Almada, I have the word. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, now I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Dimitri Timoshko. Dr. Timoshko is composer and professor at Princeton University. He's author of the celebrated and wonderful The Geometry of Music, 
and prepares his most recent project, the book Tonality and Owner's Manual. Please join me to welcome Dr. Chimosko. Thank you for thank you very much for coming, for accepting our invitation. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see my presentation. And is that good? Can everyone see that? Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Excellent. And did you just hear a note? Great. OK. So today I'm going to talk about repetition, and I am very excited to be here and to present this new material, which I think is some of my best work that I've done in quite a while. And I wanted to start by giving a big picture account of what I am doing. My current ambition is to understand tonal practice in an unusually general way, both that applies across styles so that we can think about continuities between what Palestrina is doing and what Stravinsky is doing. And also so that we can make a theory of tonal music be more relevant to contemporary composition. And today I will be talking in particular about repetition and sequence. And I will be arguing that a general theory of repetition touches on many different topics, rounds, sequences, voice leading, neo-Riemannian theory, atonal wedges and k-nets, the parallel transport of vectors, and many other things besides. So the topic of repetition is a deep one. And my talk has four parts. Each one will take about 12 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. And the first part of the talk is about the connection between repetition and symmetry. Now, Suppose we write a passage of music like this one measure passage here, and we want to repeat it. What can we do? The first and most obvious thing to do is just play it unchanged. And again, give me a thumbs up if you hear this. OK, and that is fine, but it gets boring relatively quickly. So another thing that we can do is transform the, the, our unit of music so as to preserve its essential structure. Now, the most familiar transformation is the sequence where we move the music through pitch. So here I transpose each successive unit of the sequence downward by one step in the diatonic scale to get a diatonic sequence. <laughs> And this gives us both repetition and change. Another equally important option is to move the music not through pitch, but through the ensemble. And in this case, each the music in each voice goes down an octave to the next voice in each successive measure. And this, is, this produces what's called a round. And it sounds like this. <laughs> And I think it's quite interesting how that permutation of voices keeps the music lively and interesting. The third possibility, of course, is to combine transposition and permutation so as to move the music both through pitch space and through the instrumental ensemble, producing a transposing round, which sounds like this. Oh, excuse me, I clicked on the wrong thing. Now, I should say, in constructing these examples, I'm drawing on a little bit of historical knowledge. In, it's not completely easy to come up with a little fragment of music that works as a sequence and a round and a transposing round. And knowing how to do this kind of thing was part of the knowledge that constituted uh, comp compositional expertise in the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, there's a connection here with the topic of symmetry. The operations we've looked at are subsets of what Calendar Quinn and I called the optic symmetries. 
When we apply transposition to our unit, we form a sequence. When we apply permutation, we form a round. When we apply a combination of these things, we form a transposing round. Now, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to use a notation for representing repeating passages. It's arrow notation. And here I have some repeating sequential cell. And then I have a series of arrows that do two things. They transpose the music and they move it from voice to voice. So this arrow means that whatever is in this top voice gets transposed by X scale steps and moved down into the second voice. Whatever is in the second voice gets transposed by Y semitones and moved up into the first voice. And meanwhile, whatever is in the third voice gets transposed by Z semitones and stays in the third voice. I will use a boldface T for chromatic transposition and a regular T for transposition along some scale, usually a diatonic scale. This is what traditional theory calls real and tonal sequences. For me, that's not a very important distinction. It just refers to what scale we happen to be operating. Now, these arrows stay fixed throughout the sequence. They represent a fixed sequential structure that does not change. Now I'm going to give you a series of definitions so that we can understand the different kinds of sequences that are available to us. The first is the difference between a transpositional and a canonic sequence. A transpositional sequence has no crossed arrows and all its T subscripts equal. A canonic sequence has crossed arrows, and these crossed arrows create canons by linking musical voices into groups that cycle through the same material. So here we have a transpositional canon from the first uh, C minor fugue in the well-tempered clavier. And Okay, here the scale is changing, but we won't pay much attention to that. Whatever is in each voice goes up by step and moves to the next voice. Here we have a round. This is a canonic sequence with three crossed arrows forming a three voice canon. This is the original version of Three Blind Mice from 1609. And so on. And here we have a canonic sequence from the G-sharp minor fugue in the second book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. This is both, um, here we move through pitch and through the instrumental ensemble. The top two voices exchange their material in canon. The bottom voice goes down by a fifth with each repetition. Definition two. A collection of arrows is harmonically stable if their transpositions are all the same up to octave shifts. So this sequence is harmonically stable because going up by fourth is the same as going down by fifth in mathematical language three equals minus four mod seven. This sequence from Beethoven's Opus 90 E minor piano sonata is unstable because this top voice always goes down by semitone, the bottom voice goes up by semitone. Now, unstable wedge sequences are fundamental to early atonal music and feature prominently in K-net theory, as we will see. Here is a wedge sequence from uh, Angst und Hoffen, the seventh song in Schoenberg's book of the Hanging Garden. And the sequence starts here. The top two voices go down by semitone. The bottom voice goes up by semitone. And as David Lewin pointed out, the voice continues the wedge sequence here. It sounds like this. We'll start a little before this. So again, I want to think about music very generally, and so I want to consider these kinds of atonal sequences alongside tonal sequences. In tonal music, harmonically unstable sequences often exploit invertible counterpoint, like this lovely sequence from the second D minor prelude in the Well-Tempered Clavier.
The music in the left hand goes up two octaves to the right hand. The music in the right hand goes down an octave in a fifth to the left hand. 14 is not equal to negative 11 mod 7. This is invertible counterpoint at the 12th with the whole sequential unit moving uh, by each step. My third definition has to do with the simple period and the grand period two different notions of a sequential period. The, sequen the simple period is the length of the repeating sequential unit, the minimal amount of music it takes to generate the sequence. The grand period is the time it takes for each voice to be transposed by the same amount plus octave shifts, which could differ in each voice. Now, in the presence of permutation or in a harmonically unstable sequence, the grand period is generally some multiple of the simple period. Now, I don't think that many theorists have made this distinction before, and I'm hoping some of my friends in the audience, like Dan Harrison, if they've encountered this distinction before, I would like them to tell me. So in our earlier examples, the simple period was always one bar. In the transpositional sequence, the grand period is also one bar because every voice gets transposed by the same amount each bar. Here, the grand period is three bars where the simple period is just one. And the same is also true here because it takes three bars for each melody to come back to its starting point. In Beethoven's contrary motion sequence, the simple period is one beat because that's all you need to make the sequence. But the grand period is six beats because that's what it takes for the two voices to end up a, a tenth apart or a major third apart. Here we have C and E. And then here we have F sharp and B flat. So they've returned to their original alignment. My fourth definition is, has to do with registral stability. In a registrally stable sequences, sequence, voices move by the same distance over each grand period. Whereas in a contrary motion sequence, voices change distance by one or more octaves over each grand period. Here is a sequence from Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata that is a contrary motion sequence. Now, this is a very common Beethovenian pattern. It's, I actually call this the Ludwig schema, and I talk about this in my new book. Here, I've just shown what happens over each grand period. F goes up three diatonic steps to become B flat. A flat goes down a, a diatonic fifth to become D flat. Now, many of you who are fans of math and music, I are thinking one thought right now. You are thinking we've used three of the five optic symmetries. What about the others? Now C stands for cardinality change and it does not produce very interesting sequences. Maybe they occur in orchestra contexts where more and more uh, instruments join a repeating pattern. But it is possible to use inversion to make a sequence. Here we take a sequential unit and we turn it upside down each time we repeat it. But the fourth talk Fourth part of my talk will about be about these inversional sequences, and we will see that they bring us very close to the central concerns of neo-Riemannian theory. Here is an inversional sequence, just so you can know what they sound like. So it's pretty amazing that all of this music is generated just by one bar. The voices here are in a one bar inversional canon. So whatever is in this top voice is echoed in exact diatonic inversion by this bottom voice one bar later. They're also in a two bar transpositional canon. So this first bar, first voice is echoed two bars later by the middle voice down an octave. So this is quite a uh, densely knitted structure. And that, you'll be glad to learn, is the end of the first part of my talk. And now we are going to be um, talking about the subject of repeating contrapuntal patterns. So I'm going to introduce this topic by imagining I played this diatonic voice leading, and I asked you to repeat it. Suppose I said, here is a pattern. Go ahead and continue it. What would you do? And I'm going to actually stop talking here and I'm going to wait 10 or 15 seconds and just let you think about how you would repeat this pattern. 
what is the next step? If this is step one and this is step two, what is step three? So I'm now going to count silently to 10 while you think about that. And then I'm going to come back and talk about the different answers you could have. Okay, it turns out, fortunately, that basically any answer you give is a good one. There are two possible things that we could do. One is we continue the motions in each voice to form a wedge sequence like this. Okay, and that produces a harmonically unstable sequence, sort of like the Beethoven contrary motion wedge we looked at before. It's an oblique diatonic wedge. The other thing you can do is move the melodic motion from voice to voice. And that actually produces a harmonically stable sequence. Here, the fifth always moves down by step to produce another interval belonging to the same class. Here's a fourth, and again, the fifth above the root moves down by step, okay? So these two voices move in canon. Each one repeats its note and then moves down by step. Top voice here is one beat behind the bottom voice. So a repeating contrapuntal pattern is a sequence around just like we've been considering whose unit is just one note long. And here I have examples from 400 years of music history. We have Josquin using that one there. Here we have Beethoven. And here is Stravinsky from the Firebird. And you'll notice here I've written melodic intervals in parentheses. So this notation means the E moves down by step and then that motion shifts to the bottom voice. You don't need these T um, these T notations if you know the melodic intervals. So it's a little bit redundant, but I've found it's less confusing to write these melodic intervals. So here the E moves up by two chromatic semitones and then that motion switches voices so that now the bottom voice moves up by two chromatic semitones. So repeating contrapuntal patterns can be associated with phrases like voice X moves up by five semitones and then this melodic interval moves to voice Y. Voice Y moves down by seven semitones, and then this motion shifts to voice X. We can think of them very loosely as combining two voice leadings, one of which determines the melodic intervals, move voice, up, move voice X up by five semitones, and another that permutes these melodic intervals from voice to voice. Its motion moves to voice Y. Now, there's a very cool geometry of repeating contrapuntal patterns that has to do with what geometers call parallel transport. So a voice leading here is a path. This is the two note Mobius strip that represents voice leading relations among chromatic dyads. And here we have a transposition of the voice leading we started with. Now the question is when you have to repeat this voice leading, what you have to do is move this path so that it begins where it ends. And there are actually two ways to do this. We can move it northwest so that we just move it along the arrow, in which case it looks like A. Or we can move it rightward off the edge of the Mobius strip so it turns upside down and ends up at B. In either case, we've converted a single musical event into an ongoing musical process, which is something quite magical and interesting. Okay, now things are going to start to get tricky. A harmonically stable repeating contrapuntal pattern will connect transpositionally related chords by definition. And since its arrows all have the same subscript up to octave displacements, the melodic intervals will follow the permutation of the chordal elements like root, third, fifth, etc. So what this means is that the structure of the chord itself tells you how to repeat the voice leading if you want this property of harmonic consistency. So here's Josquin's sequence, and we can describe it by saying the root, whatever voice it is in, moves down by step while the third moves up by third. And that is true at every stage of the sequence. The root changes from top voice to bottom and back, but it always moves down by step. In the sequence we began with, the fifth always moves down by step. 
So geometrically, a repeating contrapuntal pattern is an arrow that connects two chords of the same type, which is then moved along the line of transposition, which is horizontally in this case. And these are very deep and magical structures. Now, we've only been talking about repeating contrapuntal patterns or sequences with just one note in their units. But of course, these are important to understand large unit sequence as, as well, because they will connect the sonorities that are in analogous positions of successive units. Okay, so here's a sequence again from the well-tempered clavier. And if we only look at the first two notes, we have B and G. And then these move over the course of the sequence to D and F sharp. This is exactly the voice leading that Josquin used in his canon, but now Bach fills it in with a lot of other music. Here is a passage from Ligeti's Passacaglia Ungarese. This sequence has a two measure unit. And as it repeats, the top voice goes down by octave, the bottom voice stays fixed, the two voices switch. So from the start of one unit to the other, we have what I call a transposition along the chord. C moves down to E and E moves down to C. This is beautiful music that is drawing on a very ancient musical technique. Now, what this means is we can associate harmonically consistent sequences with different kinds of voice leading. Contrary motion sequences can only be generated by voice leadings that have voice exchanges, whereas registrally stable sequences can always be generated by crossing free voice leading. Now, this is a very delicate association. It's, there's actually a many to one relationship between types of, between voice leadings and sequences. But what I just told you is true. Now, what this means for us is that sequences depend on a small number of voice leading possibilities, which we can catalog using geometry. Many of these possibilities just turn out to contain canons or contrary motion expansion. And what this means is that the presence or absence of canon in a sequence is often a matter of whether or not a composer chooses to draw out the canonic potential that is latent in the musical material. And here's a wonderful example of what I call canon decline. This is a sequence from the D minor fugue in the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. The, upper, the outer voices are in canon. The first voice goes down by third, up by step, down by third, up by step. The bass voice goes up by step, down by third, up by step, down by third. But Bach does not make this canon at all obvious. He almost goes out of his way to, dis to disguise the elegant canonic structure that is there in his material. Here's a wonderful example of contrary motion decline, the start of Beethoven's Tempest Sonata. If you transpose this music up by octave, the two hands would form a giant contrary wedge of the sort that Beethoven loved to write, but he doesn't exploit that potential here. Now, in one of the Opus 59 string quartets, Beethoven does use this very same contrapuntal pattern, this very same sequence, but there he does draw out the contrary motion potential. So he certainly knew about this possibility. He just chose not to exploit it here. And what I think is wonderful here is it gives us a way of understanding metaphors like the will of the tones, because it allows us to connect high level compositional possibilities like canon, imitation, contrary motion wedges to very basic possibilities that are latent in the material itself, rather than being the exclusive product of compositional design. So 
being an expert composer in some sense is knowing how certain kinds of basic musical moves lend themselves to certain kinds of high level devices like cannon or contrary motion wedges. Now, all of this has some really interesting connections to Heinrich Schenker. Schenker considered sequences to be purely linear devices. He actually denied that sequences existed as distinct from purely linear intervallic progressions. I disagree with this, but I think he was motivated by some real insights. First, he noticed, I think, that if we isolate the chords at the start of successive sequential units, we almost always find familiar voice leading patterns. And these arise from the need to minimize motion, either of individual voices or of larger sequential units as you move from uh, one sequential unit to the next. So he noticed that there was a link between the kinds of voice leading relations we find right there on the musical surface connecting adjacent chords and these larger relations between, uh, between points that might not be at all adjacent in the music. Also by definition, we always find transpositional motion or purely linear motion from the start of one grand period to another. So I think that Schenker probably also noticed that if we zoom out far enough, sequences reduce to just parallel motion. Now, these are mathematical truths, but I don't think they mean that sequences harmonies are insignificant or that they represent the notes at the start of their unit. So I suspect Schenker noticed some really important musical properties, but maybe didn't have the mathematical tools to describe them. And that's not so surprising because this is a really subtle area of music theory. I'm going to end this part of the talk by giving you a recipe that allows you to generate a sequence from a voice leading. So we begin by choosing any harmonically consistent voice leading, like this one here. I have a G major chord over a C, so the fourth above the root appears in the bass. And now I here have an F major chord over a B flat. So one major chord to another, but they also have the fourth above the bass, and it sounds like this. And after you write that voice leading, you then draw transpositional arrows, which is a purely algorithmic process. Even a computer can do it. You connect the root to the root, the third to the third, the fourth to the fourth, the fifth to the fifth. And then you use these arrows to make a repeating contrapuntal pattern. And then if you want, you can take these sequential units and expand them and give them more melodic content. So here we are using these ancient devices of sequence and repetition in a contemporary harmonic context. And for those of you who are composers, you can go to my website, madmusicalscience.com slash canons.html, and you can actually program in these canons. And I will just show you how that works. This is a tool for exploring canonic relationships. Um, let's just recreate that sequence. We'll type in our initial notes and we will indicate how the voices move melodically. I put a star here as the explanation website explains. Bass voice goes down by two semitones, next voice goes up by three, next voice goes up by two, top voice goes up by one. I will put a question mark in the permutation field, which indicates that I want the program to calculate a permutation that makes a harmonically consistent sequence. I press show and unfortunately, oh, my sound is off. Let me see if I can try that again. Okay, hopefully you can hear that. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. There's our repeating contrapuntal pattern. If we wanna make it a more complicated sequence, we just tell the program that our melodic units are longer using these, this parenthesis notation with R for rest. Okay, I joked to one of my friends that I like this pro progression so much that this is all I'm ever gonna use in my music from now on. I'm not going to use any other chord progressions. All right, so now let me go back to my talk. Um, uh, oops, I'm in the wrong 
view slideshow, type in 52. And now I'm going to explain what you can do with all of this. The first set of applications are historical. Repeating contrapuntal patterns appear in a really wide range of styles, Renaissance music, Baroque and classical music, usually embedded into larger sequences, but not always, jazz, atonal music, modern tonalish music as written by Ligeti and Stravinsky. So they're this hugely basic, very important aspect of musicianship that as far as I know, hasn't really been delineated and scrutinized and explored. Let me just show you a couple modern examples. Here's Schoenberg's Farben, which is a canonic, not in a harmonically stable sequence that uses this very complicated arrow diagram here. We'll listen to the opening part of that piece. Here's a repeating contrapuntal pattern from the Rite of Spring during the procession of the sage. Top voice goes down by two, bottom voices go up by four, but this contrary motion always forms diminished seventh chords. Ah. Right after this, he repeats the sequence, but now with dominant sevenths. So Stravinsky shows a really cool abstract understanding of sequential technique where he can use the same basic procedure with different, um, different sonorities. All right, so what's really neat here is we convert an isolated contrapuntal move, which is a voice leading, which is an event into a repeating process. It's just a matter of doing the same thing over and over again, possibly embedding this contrapuntal schema within a larger unit. So I think that a really important component of musicianship is just knowing how to repeat a voice leading. And this is something we can actually teach students how to do. This is a general skill that is fun to train your students to develop. Another really important uh, fact here is that these repeating contrapuntal patterns provide a path between contrapuntal and harmonic thinking because they are both sequences or repeating harmonic progressions and canons, right? And so what they show is that an interest in canon could lead to an awareness of harmonic repetition and patterning. Here is a Palestrina sequence that uses actually that same Josquin uh, sequence we looked at before that arises out of close imitation. This is from the Sanctus of the Misa Ave Regina Coilorum. And it sounds like this, you'll hear the canon. So Palestrina's thinking imitation but he's producing sequence as a byproduct. Now, when Mozart uses basically the inversion of this pattern, he is thinking about harmony and counterpoint as well. An even more magical possibility is that repeating contrapuntal patterns provide a route toward inversional equivalence. Because essentially the only way you can conveniently make these kinds of repeating sequences and have them be harmonically consistent is if structurally similar, similar chordal elements always move the same way. So Josquin might not have been thinking about root and third, right? But when you're writing a sequence like this, basically the only way to get it to work out is if the root always moves down by step while the third always moves up by third. And so if you're examining the structure of this kind of sequence and wondering how, how do I know which voice moves in which way, you could easily be led to the idea of putting everything as registrally into a registrally compact position and the bottom note in that arrangement, that's the note that moves down by step. In this sequence, you wouldn't need to do that, but in a more complicated multi-voice sequence, you actually have to go through something like that calculation just to figure out what note comes next. So here's a three voice sequence that where the harmonies move up by step and where the root always moves down by third and the other notes move down by step. And that 
those motions switch from voice to voice. Turning now to later music, I think really thinking about sequence shows the importance of rounds in classical music. We don't think of rounds as being a basic classical, basic classical music device. From my point of view, rounds and sequences are just the same thing. Rounds appear in classical music when composers want an active melody, melody over static harmony. The most common round is this one here, um, which produces this melody in, in, in canon. And when it appears in gallant music, Bob Yerdingen calls it the printer or the fenaroli, depending on where it is in the key. But you can find this going back to the early Renaissance. I've got an example from 1504 or something like that. Here's a wonderful Mozart round from the C minor piano fantasy. He's just standing on the do dominant, as Kaplan would say. And when the music repeats, the top voice goes down by an octave and the bottom voice stays in its registral position and the top two voices switch octaves. And so we can notate the sequence here and it sounds like this. Okay, that's pretty obvious. My favorite round in the entire classical tradition comes at the end of the first movement of Beethoven's D major piano sonata opus 10, number three. And it's a giant contrary motion wedge to the cadence. And you would never ever think of looking for canon or contrapuntal trickery at all. And yet you have a round in these upper two voices. Sorry. Okay. And it sounds like this. So this to me is really magical because I feel like I'm really communicating with Beethoven or understanding what he's trying to say to me because you, know, you might just think this is a flourish but it's a flourish that's created by a canonic round. Another really interesting topic for me is near sequences or sequences that are not quite exact. Um, you can change the music in the unit, you can change the transposition, or more rarely you can change the permutation. And so sometimes I notate these things by giving a list. Here's another sequence from the uh, C minor fugue in book one. Now, a pedantic and unimaginative analysis of this sequence would say, look, it's got a four beat period because that is what it takes for the bass to repeat. And this is true. However, the upper voices have a clear canonic relationship and they have a two beat period, right? Like many descending fifth sequences throughout the literature. Furthermore, the bass voice is almost repeating at the two beat interval. If you look at these six notes, or seven notes, they descend in a scale that moves by seventh. And that happens again here, and that happens again here. Now, if Bach really made an exact sequence like this, the left hand would fall off the edge of the keyboard very quickly and it would be very unmusical. So to keep the sequence registrally aligned, the bottom voice moves down by fourth and up by third, and he adjusts the music a little bit so that it still sounds good. So yes, technically, pedantically, it has a four beat unit, but spiritually, musically, we should think of it as a slightly altered two beat unit. Now you can take this idea even farther into what I call sequential reduction. And here we have the interesting idea that sequences can give us reductional targets, allowing the analyst to reduce an irregular surface to a more regular background. So this is very different from standard Schenkerian analysis, where you remove a bunch of notes and you turn everything into a corral. Here, what you do is you remove compositional decision points and you analyze the music by producing a background that is just as long as the foreground, but it's one that's regular. It's, it's one that can be produced by a machine. And then you imagine the composer generating the music by tinkering with the output of the regular machine to produce an irregular resultant. And a lovely example of this is the Beethoven Opus 109 variations theme. And the theme is right here. And you would never think of it as sequential, but here I analyze it as a kind of distorted contrary motion wedge of the sort that appears so often in Beethoven's music.
Okay, so Schenker would turn this into three, two, one, and would grab one of these F sharps and make that uh, make it a corral like structure. I say it's a hidden sequence. How can we tell the difference between these? How can we judge between these reductions? Well, let's listen to the third variation where, where Beethoven makes the contrary motion design completely explicit. What we have here is something very deep. We have variations proceeding not by progressive embellishment of a melody, the way you, the way Mozart does it, but you have variations stripping away the decorations to reveal an underlying logical regular sequential structure. And this is something Beethoven does in a number of his variations movements. Finally, a lot of recent music has been super repetitive. It seems to me that transformed repetition is a very natural subject that composers might want to explore. All right, very quickly, I'm going to go back to inversional sequences and talk about how this connects to neo-Riemannian theory, and then we can have some questions. So here's the inversional sequence I played you before where I took this unit of music and every time I repeat it, I invert it. These are the index numbers of the inversions measured in diatonics. Uh, in, in a diatonic notation where middle C is 60. This is a harmonically stable sequence since all these index numbers are the same modulo seven. It's also a very boring sequence that only goes through two chords, C and B diminished. This is always true because if you repeat the same inversion twice, you end up returning to your starting pitch. And that's the nature of inversion. And this is why strict inversional sequences are not very common. So one thing we can do is combine inversion and transposition and just shift each unit downward when we repeat it. And here you'll see the index numbers decreasing by two with each unit. It sounds like this. I had to let it go on a long time because you can hear it gradually forming a cadence and getting back to the tonic. Okay, so inversional sequences are almost always inexact. When I first found this marvelous sequence in box C major two part invention, I was disappointed that it was not perfectly exact, but now I realize it had to be that way. Here, the bottom voice gets inverted in what I call the, the contextual inversion top to bottom, where the top note becomes the bottom note of the inverted figure. And that's always true. Top note becomes bottom. The top note gets transposed down by 10 or 11 diatonic steps in alternation. It sounds like this. Okay. Now, if you go to repeating contrapuntal patterns, it turns out that the basic transformations of neo-Riemannian theory can be expressed as repeating contrapuntal patterns that operate by inversion. So here are the LP and R transformations represented just as sequences. And you might intuitively think that you do one thing by turning C major into E minor here and another thing by turning E minor back to C major. Probably the central innovation of neo-Riemannian or even of original Riemannian theory is that these two things are the same thing. And our sequential notion captures that this entire progression is captured by this little network here. Same with this, same with that. Of course, this leads to a static alternation of two harmonies. We can get more harmonic variety by adding transposition, just like I did with my larger unit. Here I start with a neo-Riemannian transformation called the hex pole progression. And I've added a little more mathematical detail up here. And now I transpose every chord downward by step. Here are the equations I use. The inversion numbers are determined now by the input pitches and everything slides down and we get a very common or a somewhat common tonal sequence that appears at the start of Gesualdo's Moro Lasso. It's been used by Schubert. It appears at the end of Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. It appears in the Shostakovich E minor string, I mean C minor string quartet.
Here's Mozart basically doing the same trick, but now he moves the minor thirds down in parallel, not the major thirds. And if we do this in diatonic space, we get our favorite friend. Apocalypse Canon. All of these examples use the same basic sequential equations, but with a different starting point. So they're all in some sense, the same sequence. My last slide is back to that Schoenberg piece, Angst und Hoffen. And here I analyze the piece um, by, in terms of a single repeating voice leading pattern, which appears upside down and which has a parameter controlling the, destin the transposition of the second chord. We then get a Neo-Riemannian sequence that uses the L transform as applied to the Viennese fourth chord expressed by this uh, equation here. We then get the wedge sequence that appears twice. The first time it's continued by the voice. The second time there's an overlapping second sequence that occurs here that uh, continues in the piano. So the whole thing is a network of repeated voice leading patterns and repeated sequences. So this is the kind of thing David Lewin wanted to use K-nuts to analyze. I think sequences are a better op option. A general theory of repetition touches on many, many different topics all throughout music theory and all throughout the history of music. Repetition is deep and very important. And I hope that this talk makes you think about it in a new way and makes you more excited and interested in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Timoshko. Uh, we already have one question for you. Uh, maybe I should um, share the, my screen here with the question. It's uh, from Max Kuhn. Um, it's a master's student. Um, so that's the question. I don't know if you can read it. Um, yes, I can. Okay. Um... Uh, so I am interested in Brazilian music. I, I don't know very much about it. Um, and yeah, uh, so the answer to the first question, yes, but I don't have anything useful to say about it right now. Um, there are a lot of these repeated contrapuntal patterns in jazz, particularly um, uh, for connecting large cardinality chords. And this is something that I am interested in. Um, yeah, so a lot of the language of jazz in terms of guide tones and upper structures and how they move um, can be usefully described in terms of voice leading sequences. And that's something I, I hope to get into later. Um, yes, and then there are some of these contrary motion. Uh, the omnibus sequence is a sequence just like the one that I've talked about. It's a, it's a four voice sequence where the upper three voices move as one unit and the bass moves separately. And there are analogs to these kinds of things, particularly in jazz contexts where maybe the upper voices are going down by semitone and the left hand is going down by fifth or the harmony is going down by fifth. So all of this stuff sort of becomes a crucial part of, uh, of jazz language and to the extent that that influences, you know, Joe Beam's music and the Brazilian music that as well. Uh, great. We have another question here. Let me um, copy for you here. 
the second. This is a question by um, Hugo Carvalho. Um, so, uh, harmonically stable, I defined it the way I did. It is a definition and it's my, it's my concept. I defined it the way I did because um, it means that no matter what is in your sequential unit, if you have a harmonically stable uh, sequence, you will end up with preserving the set class. Okay, so so harmonically stable sequences preserve harmonic structure in a very general way, and it doesn't matter what the unit is. As we saw, you can create sequences like the Bach E minor prelude one where he uses inversional counterpoint. That sequence is harmonically stable in a general intuitive sense, even though it doesn't meet my technical definition of harmonic stability. But what it does is it utilizes special properties of the sequential unit. So if you change the sequential unit, you would get something that was more obviously unstable. So I think this is a really good question because I, I think it's probably motivated by the fact that there are sequences that sound harmonious and sound consonant that do not meet my definition of harmonic stability. And those sequences involve a very close calibration of the content of the unit to the to the structure of the arrows. And that's what you don't need to think about if you're just using a, a harmonically stable sequence as I defined it. Great. Uh, anybody from uh, from the room here uh, wants to make any questions? Just uh, turn the mic on. Um, I would like to make a question. Can I? Yes, go ahead, Professor. Um, Dimitri, thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting. So my curiosity is about your mathematical notation for the transformation you present to us. Because the way you notate in the presentation, I think does not appear to me the equations you really are using. So I, I, I'm, I'm wondering how do, do you do that? In my, I, I'm guessing. So as I can, I, I might guessing. So you're using a kind of vector notation and you do apply transformation with matrices. But since you didn't expose anything about that, I'm very curious if you can give a grasp of the, the formalization of your model. Well, so I do believe I am using the notation that I showed you, but I have shown this material to a number of other people, and it is very confusing at first, partly because we have to learn to think in two ways. We have to, sometimes we, we tend to think melodically, uh, and the arrows force us to make a set of connections that in some cases are more natural, particularly with rounds or with, with sequences that have larger units, but which are really very unnatural when you're talking about repeating contrapuntal patterns or the smaller unit sequence. So I realize that this notation looks very confusing, but I promise you, I don't have any secret math that I am holding back from you. I, I am using the structures that I showed you, but I'm also using my computer program. And, and I wrote the computer program in the website because I got so tired of making mistakes while I was trying to construct these sequences that I decided it would be much better to have a website that just did the calculations for me and, and allowed me to think about the musical part and not about that calculation part. Uh... Great, we have uh, two questions, one by Daniel Moreira. Maybe he wants to make it here. And uh, one by uh, Professor Andreata. Daniel, if you want to go first. 
Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was um, really my explosion for me and a lot of ideas that come up. Uh, I work with texture, musical texture, based on Wallace Bever's work. And I would like to know what is the relation you see between these changes of lines from the ensemble and the music, music, music texture based on uh, Wallace Bever's work. Right, so this is a, a great question. Uh, so I, I can't speak about Wallace Berry as much directly, but what I can say is that there is a huge aesthetic question in 20th and 21st century music, which is what do we do about imitation? And the question is what does imitation mean in an expanded harmonic language where almost anything can be a, a sonority? And one answer that many people have given is that imitation is more of a texture than anything else. So in Steve Reich, he uses imitation all the time and he uses it to create something like a, the sound of a digital delay. The cannons are almost always unison cannons and it sounds like an echo and it's a very beautiful but very clear texture. Uh, and it has more of a textural meaning than the kind of matrix that it is in Palestrina where you are hearing harmony and line woven together. And I would say that is true in Bartok too, it, at the beginning of strings, percussion and celesta, the imitation creates the texture that is part of a giant expansion. So what I would say is that there's a huge and interesting question, which is what do we do with imitation now? And one of the big answers is to treat it as a way of generating texture. This is what Ligeti does with micro polyphony, right? There's a lot of canons there, but it's a way to produce density rather than the older way of producing a weave of harmony and melody. So that's as far as I've gotten, but I need to do more thinking about exactly that question. I just wanted to go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dimitri, for a wonderful talk, really. Uh, I, I was just wondering uh, if there, there is a, an interest maybe in trying to apply your uh, theoretical stuff to uh, treatises like uh, uh, Bernard Zinn Canonic Studies, which actually is really based on inversional symmetries. And well, I, I believe that there is a way of really formalizing uh, the, the, the compositional processes in a more elegant way in, uh, with respect that he, he was doing in the, the beginning of the century. And maybe uh, this also puts some light into uh, more, more sophisticated and contemporary techniques. Uh, what, what do you think about? <laughs> so I don't know that treatise. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a big historian of theory. And so that one of my, I think one of my strengths and also weaknesses is I much prefer to just think about music rather than read other people thinking about music. And sometimes it leads me to new ideas and sometimes I rediscover the wheel. I will say that the sequence, the things I showed today are all in the intermediate space between imitation and repetition. And the reason is that the error, the the period of imitation and the period of repetition is the same. There are a lot of sequences where those two periods comes apart and some, some canons that have no repetition at all. And what you need to do then is to take my T arrows and give them a new parameter that delays the music through time. So you can have a T arrow. So in my, in, in these sequences, all my, those arrows can be thought of as delays that are delaying by the same amount. But mm -hmm. in lots of canonic music and non-repeating music, uh, those arrows delay by different amounts. And, and so that's a very natural extension to the model that, that allows you to consider passages that are less about repetition and more about imitation. I would say the, the things I look at are really they're more repetition than, than imitation. They might have imitation in them, mm -hmm. but they're constrained by the idea of repetition. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor Timosh, we have one last question here. Um, I will share this, my screen. It's um, by Andrea Codesso, one of our students here. Um, Yeah, okay, this is, a, this is an interesting question. And here what I would say is, yes, it depends. So 
in the simplest case, the repeating musical cell is a metrical unit, right? So you repeat a measure of the music. So the repetition reinforces the underlying meter. Um, but you can also have very interesting situations where, like if you have just a single note cell, if you have a repeating contrapuntal pattern, then the, then the repetition can be sort of, can, can uh, cut against the meter. Uh, I would say there's also a natural, even in that case, the grand period tends to have a metrical function because we tend to hear the voices returning to the same point in the melodies that they create. So the relation between these things and meter is, is another really interesting subject. I should say everything I presented to you now, it all looks so obvious, but it took me years to, to put all of these phenomena together and to try to, 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 to find one framework that would allow me to, to think about them. And so even though this is really just the beginning of the ex exploration of a larger talk, it, it is the result of a lot of, of, of effort on my part. And so, so um, and even now I had to sort of totally rethink this presentation when I tried to, I tried to teach this material to my students and they all got deeply confused. And so um, uh, I really appreciate the kind words that people have, have uh, said to me, and I'm really grateful for my chance to to just start um, uh, explaining some of these basic ideas about repetition. And my hope is that other people will be able to take them farther and think about a much wider range of music than I've been able to think about. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Timoshko. Uh, Rondo Felmada, I want to say something. Uh, we now um, are two minutes. Um, late for the uh, first round table, which is on algorithm and music. So uh, if our mother want to say something, we just move to, round, to the round table. I would like to say that we are profoundly grateful by your talk, your presence, your Congress. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. Uh, so we now start uh, the uh, round table, the first round table, um, algorithms and music. We have uh, three, um, three presenters here. Uh, I will uh, introduce each one um, as they turn. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, Professor Moreno Andreata. He is a CNRS uh, director of research at uh, the Institut de Recherche Mathematique Avancée of the University of Strasbourg and associate research within the music representation team at IRCAM, whereas he, uh, he is responsible of the SMEAR, Structural Music Information Research Project. He teaches mathematical models in songwriting at the University of Strasbourg within the undergraduate program in popular music, as well as computational musicology within the ATE, uh, ATM master level program of the Sorbonne University. He conceived the Math in Pop project labeled by the CNRS uh, within the celebrations for the um, eighth uh, anniversary of the CNRS and the 2019-2020 year of mathematics. Uh, welcome, Professor. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really pleased to, to join you and to join this roundtable on algorithms and music. Huge topic. And uh, as you have seen from Dmitry uh, Timochko's presentation, there are algorithms everywhere. And I think uh, it's, it's really uh, a very important point in the, in the music formalization process. So I start my, to share my uh, my screen here. Oh, uh, what is the, the sound? Yeah. Can you see? Uh, not yet. 
Oh, no, yes. Yeah, so I will, I will speak about uh, pros and techniques of mathematical learning. And uh, this is something I, I really like uh, to try to teach math through music. And since we are in a algorithmic music uh, roundtable via computer science. So uh, I will start with this kind of diagram which uh, accompanies me since almost, almost 20 years now, uh, where I, from the time in which I started doing some math and music research, my, my focus was trying to find musical problems that you can uh, take as a starting point in order to, to improve uh, kind of results in mathematics or can, kind of try to, to do some uh, true mathematical research but starting from a musical problem. So the starting point is a musical problem, a musical object that can be formalized and uh, you can have a mathematical statement. Then you can generalize, you have a general result, general theorems. Uh, sometimes you have new theorems, sometimes you have old theorems, but since you started with a musical problem, that's also very interesting uh, because in mathematics is not just the, the final result which, uh, which counts, it's also the process that leads you to a, to a, to a theorem. And then you go back to music with the, the application. Uh, you can go to music analysis, music theory, composition, and, and this is really uh, kind of interrelated in, in particular in 20th century uh, music. And, and so back to the musical, original musical problem. So this is a kind of uh, movement, uh, a dynamic movement that it, which is for me the essence of a math musical activity. And as you can see, there is a, uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, interface in which you find uh, computer science. I, I put open music as a just uh, just an example. Uh, it's the graphical uh, visual programming language developed at IRCAM. In this case, you have a general theorems which are modelized, so that you have a computer aided model, and then you give the model to composers because you cannot give uh, a general theorem to composers and ask them to compose. You are, you are providing tools, uh, and Open Music is integrating a lot of. Uh, knowledge about uh, uh, mathematical uh, general theorems that can be really used in, in a compositional way. So this is one way of using uh, computer science, but there is another other uh, kind of uh, possibilities. There are problems in which you are using the modeling in this formalization process. Think, uh, for example, to uh, all the enumeration of uh, uh, all interval series, for example, the, uh, there is no really theory about the construct constructability of, of this uh, all interval series or uh, zero relation, uh, homometric structures, for example, Hamiltonian paths in tonnets. In all these cases, you need uh, kind of algorithms in which you are kind of exploring the, the, the space of possibilities in a, by, with backtracking, uh, for example. And there is no really uh, general theorem that you can, uh, you can use in order to, to uh, model the, the, the musical problems. And the, the general theorem comes after, after the, the modelization. And in general, uh, you can really think this, this uh, interface as, a, as an intermediary step between music and mathematics. So uh, computer music is in the middle some, somehow. And uh, if you are interested, there are some books which, have, which contain recipe for, from composers uh, using uh, open music and the algorithms, uh, parts of which uh, they are really coming from all these uh, uh, math and musical uh, dynamics. So three, uh, books uh, edited by Jara Sayag, Jean Bresson, and Carlos Sagon, the OM Composers book, in the, the three volumes. Uh, for me, one of the most interesting problems uh, since 1998, where I was at Tiercam as a PhD student, was uh, the, the tiling canon process. And this is a prototypical problem. Uh, this is a way of uh, kind of starting from a musical problem, canons construction, and we have seen with Dimitri how important canons and contrapuntal uh, movements are. But if you are putting 
uh, much uh, kind of mathematical constraints like timing and trying to uh, formalize timing process in rhythmic canons, then you, you can end up with a really interesting mathematical uh, theories like uh, the theory of Wusa canons. And uh, Wusa was a is a mathematician uh, who published in Perspective of New Music in the 90s. Uh, I think the most uh, difficult papers even ever published in, in some uh, music, uh, music theoretical journals. And uh, of course, when, uh, when you are trying to understand this kind of papers as a composer, uh, you need uh, you need the algorithm in order to and model in order to explore the possibilities. So this is what we have done in the uh, late nineties. Uh, so implementing, for example, these constructions in open music, and uh, this was the start uh, starting point of a very fascinating uh, collaboration with uh, contemporary composers who uh, uh, used this algorithm and produce a lot of new music starting from these, uh, uh, these fascinating papers by, uh, by Dan Wuza. Uh, here I have a small uh, catalog of uh, math and musical problems, uh, Z relations, uh, for example, transformational theory, music analysis uh, with special computing and formal concept analysis, diatonic theory, maximum even sets, periodic sequences and final different calculus, block design and composition. There are, these are just a, a, a small, uh, this is a small, small, small catalog of musical problems in which uh, the implementation aspects, so the formalization, generalization and application really uh, describes uh, the, the, the mathematical dynamics. So, and you can see there are uh, interesting uh, intersections between this uh, different, apparently very different uh, theoretical problems, music theoretical problems. Uh, but here, uh, this MIR project, which was mentioned, is, a, is the structural music information research project that I'm, I'm working on in collaboration with ERCAM. Here you have the same problems, but uh, by uh, focusing on the mathematical tools which are underlying. So some problems are more algebraic oriented, some more topological, some more category theory oriented. In all problems, there is this computational uh, component, which is, uh, which is important. And uh, what, what I'm trying to, to do now in, in a new uh, in your project that I'm carrying on in, within the CNRS is to try to understand the cognitive uh, implications of all these pure mathematical constructions. And I, I, I would like to, to uh, share some thoughts uh, with you uh, about this cognitive relevance of uh, pure math uh, formalization. And uh, part of these uh, problems are integrated in new PhD programs. This is something which uh, started uh, this year at the University of Padua in Italy, a new PhD program in which uh, uh, experts like uh, Emanuela Mio, uh, Frankie Dzeski, Thomas Noll, Alexander Popov and PhD students, uh, such as uh, Greta Lanzarotto are uh, presenting, and myself also, are presenting these math and musical problems within a PhD program in mathematics. So the idea, the idea is really to teach mathematics starting from all these musical problems and using computer science and programming, different programming languages in order to, to build models, computational models for all these uh, music theoretical uh, problems. So this, this is uh, something which will start in next spring uh, because of the uh, emergency situation, pandemic situation, we couldn't start uh, in September, so we have to wait some more months. Uh, but uh, this is not the only possibility to share uh, and to use uh, music in order to teach uh, teach mathematics. I have wonderful experiences with with uh, young people, with with uh, people from uh, elementary school and high school. Uh, 
again, music is a, is a starting point to introduce a lot of complex mathematical uh, notions, some, sometimes in a very unexpected way. Uh, and the, the, the use of computer models, uh, in particular, as you can see here, with the uh, screens and the uh, laptop in which you can touch. Uh, and I will show you the web uh, program that we developed, which enables you to, to really use a, the, one of the most celebrated structure, which is the tonnet, in an interactive way. And, uh, and this can, can be really the starting point of a new, uh, I think, learning methodology in uh, how to teach mathematics with uh, simple uh, musical uh, constructions and, and computational aspects. So this is the, 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 the web interface, the tonnets that you find in this, uh, in this address in, in the web. Uh, I have to mention that this is the kind of uh, web uh, application which uses a lot of knowledge that we, uh, that we uh, uh, we kind of studied uh, in the last years, in particular, together with uh, Louis Vigo. This was developed by Corentin Ishawa within the SMIR project. But the starting point for me uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a work in which we are trying to uh, formalize the geometrical construction music, such as the tonnets, for example, in such a way that can, it can open interesting uh, application in, uh, in perception and in cognition. Here, uh, just show you uh, one article, which for me is a is a kind of a prototypical in the in the sense that uh, this article by Zatore Krumhans, they are using kind of the same mathematical structure, which is the tonnets, without mentioning uh, the existence of the the tonnets as a as a as a construction, and this shows a kind of difficulty of communication between. Uh, neuroscience from one side and math, maths and music community uh, or computational musicologists, mathematical uh, oriented uh, computational musicology. And I, I think the, the one interesting point in, the, in, in a project to be done is really to, to put these two communities together. So the, the neuroscience and the, and the, so the neuroscience uh, research and the uh, people working on maths and music. And the tonnet is a really kind of a, uh, fascinating object in order to do that. Uh, so just a short video to introduce in a very uh, quick way. Uh, we, we, have, we have already see, seen the, the three LPR operations with Dimitri uh, kind of formalization as a repeating contrapuntal pat pattern. But if you don't know anything about uh, tonnets, you just look to this short video in which you, you see uh, a chord as a represented as a triangle in the plane. This can be a three major chord, for example. And then you have the three main symmetries. So the relative, parallel, and the parallel operation. And so every triangle in the plane is shared as a kind of a, uh, has three uh, neighbors and so on. And you can, uh, you can uh, think about the, the kind of generality of this triangle. This is not just a uh, major chord. This can be a major chord in this particular tonnet. But of course, every three knot chord can generate by self-assembly uh, uh, a given space, a given tonnet. So you have a, uh, th this is the way in which uh, uh, Louis Bigot and uh, his thesis, uh, PhD in uh, 2013, uh, introduced neo-Riemannian theory with the help of uh, special computing. Special computing is a, is a paradigm in, uh, in computer science in which the elementary blocks are simplex, are points, are uh, segments, are triangular, are uh, tetraedra and so on. And starting with a catalog of chords, in this case is major and minor chords with the, the action of the group, 
you end up with a space. And this is just one possibility, the tonnets, the traditional tonnets. And you can use this as a way of characterizing the kind of stylistic property of, uh, of pieces of music. This is something we have done, we have presented several times in, uh, in, in our conferences, Mathematics Competition in Music together with uh, Louis Bigot. If you are taking a, a Bach choral and you are analyzing the, the compactness or uh, if you want the connexity of the trajectories of the piece in the different spaces, you see that the different tonnets, the so dif different uh, simplicia complexes are more or less present. So uh, in, in a Bach choral, typically the three, four, five tonnets, which is the traditional one uh, with major and minor chords, uh, has really uh, big values. Uh, on the contrary, uh, a prelude like voile from the BC, uh, the trajectory of the piece has, is much more connected in a tonnet of the type two, four, six. And this is not surprising because is the, the whole tone scale is a kind of uh, uh, ingredient uh, in, the, in the compositional process. And pieces like uh, Pierrot Lunaire by Schoenberg uh, shows, clearly shows that, that the, the, all the spaces, all the tone nets are kind of equal uh, relevant in the, in the in capturing the connexity of the trajectory, uh, which is just a, a geometric uh, property. So uh, this is something that you can refine with a lot of nice uh, geometric algebraic uh, tools like uh, uh, Betty numbers in order to really classify all kinds of uh, possible tonnets that you can obtain and study the perceptual relevance. So I, I show you a, a nice example. Uh, what happens if you are kind of embedding the trajectory of a piece which, uh, which is living in a space, if you are trying to embed, embed this trajectory in a different space. So it's like to, to have a Bach choral, like one for example, which lives in three, four, seven, or three, four, five, and traditional major and minor uh, on that space, which is, we, we have seen this is the kind of natural, so the, it's the space which captures the most, uh, in a most relevant way, the connexity of the trajectory. And the, the, the trajectory of the piece is, is connected, uh, so it's the compliance, if you want, is higher in this space. But what happens if you if you are embedding the trajectory in a different space, you end up with something. Just a totally different flow. Like a, uh, a fish, uh, which, is, which is transformed into another species by changing of the coordinates of the plane. And this is something that uh, the, the hexachord by Louis Bigot uh, does in an automatic way. So you are taking a music and you are putting in a different space. And what, what is interesting now is try to, to understand the cognitive uh, kind of uh, uh, process which is underlying this uh, embedding. And uh, of course, you have, you, have, uh, you have the feeling of a pentatonicity which is emerging in the, in the Bach choral, which is simply the fact that the new tone space, in the, the new space has the pentatonic scale as a, uh, as a natural substrat, as a an, an natural uh, kind of uh, uh, component with respect to the, to the original one. Yeah, and this is, uh, is more than just anecdotal. Uh, Darcy Thompson with you know, his uh, beautiful book on growth and form really tried to develop a theory of, uh, of classification of species based on the geometry. And this is something that we can, I think, do in, uh, in music. So I, I end just with uh, uh, an example because uh, there are a lot of things that really need to be understand, I think, from a cognitive point of view, from perceptual point of view, with experimental psychology, with neuroscience. And uh, something I like very much is the so-called negative harmony which is something also very fashionable uh, with Jacob Scolier, for, uh, for example, uh, courses on the web. And uh, the idea is that you, you are taking, uh, let me 
up, uh, you, are, you are taking a piece of music and you are producing so the kind of dual one. So every major chord becomes a minor, minor chord and every minor becomes a major chord. And uh, if, I, if I play the final result, there's, there, there's to be able to, to get back, to go back and, and, and to obtain or to recover the original one from the transformed one. So just make an example. Just to see if, uh, if you can grasp the underlying original version of the famous song by Beatles. Okay, so I think uh, if, if you if you listen carefully, you can maybe uh, kind of have the the intuition that there is a uh, this kind of duality which transforms every major chord into a minor one. Okay, and. So the, the, again, this, this is something I would like to better understand because there are, there are situations in which uh, this transformation is quite simple, like this one, and other transformation in which, uh, try to put away this, okay, in which uh, other pieces, like, uh, for, for example, uh, <laughs> just a, a short homage to, to uh, to uh, you, <laughs> uh, all the Brazilian colleagues, a lot of Brazilian music is for me fascinating with respect to this duality principle. So what I, uh, is, I would like to, to share with you is, is the possibility to maybe, uh, I, I will not say to understand this music, but to produce maybe, to use the complexity of some uh, traditional Brazilian music in order to obtain new uh, kind of uh, uh, grammatical uh, music uh, compositional processes by using this kind of duality principle, which is nothing else as just a rotation of uh, 180 degrees of the trajectory in the tonnet. And this is something you can do by yourself. So I, I, I share I share uh, now the the web page here, and I can I can show you the tonnet here, which is so also give me the possibility to to yeah to to present you this interface, this web interface, in which you can just click and or play. keyboard uh, with the acrobatic circle or fifth circle with the with the hexagonal tiny of the plane so which is the the dual one in a real mathematical meaning all possible tonnets like uh, what, what we see before so uh, with a with a uh, with a different kind of decomposition of the plane you have different meanings of the triangle which are building your your space and the uh, last uh, thing uh, just to, to conclude let's take a uh, an example by brazilian music I, I had something nice by ernesto nazareth escovado huh? and uh, uh, let's see what happens with if you are negative I think I'm finished, uh, and uh, uh, I can, yeah, I can. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Andreata. Uh, we have questions at the end of the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh,
Great. Uh, we now go to um, uh, Professor Marco Sampaio. Marco Sampaio is a professor and researcher of music theory and composition at the Federal University of Bahia, uh, where he obtained his PhD in music composition in 2012. As a researcher, he has worked in the area of music theory, especially computational musicology and musical counters. He is an editorial board member of the Brazilian Journal of Music and Mathematics, Busmat. Uh, he could not uh, present uh, in real time, so he sent a video. And I will share this video with you all now. Está sem áudio. Sorry about that. Um, let's see if I can um, share again. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to apologize for my absence. Unfortunately, I cannot attend the round table because I am still recovering from a severe sore throat that I have been affected for some days. I thank Professor Lidlino for broadcasting my video. And here I will ask Jamile Vasconcelos, my wife, to read my talk. I congratulate the organized committee for the event and the homage to Professor Jean Marie Oliveira. I would like to thank you for the invitation and to greet my table's partners. In this talk, I will approach some recent research on computational musicology, their related algorithms, data sets, and contributions for the study of music. In a broad sense, computational musicology is the computer-supported study of music. Klaus Friller argues that computer-supported musicology has two subfields, digital musicology, related to digitating scores, and computational musicology, with a focus on analysis often in the context of music theory, ethnomusicology, and music psychology. He also argues that while digital and computational musicology use some form of symbolic representation of music, music information retrieval works mainly with audio. Computational musicology is very important to the study of music. The research projects in this area have been corroborating and questioning music theory and providing new insights for new research projects. For this overview, in order to get the current status of research in computational musicology, Marcus has collected 30 papers published in the last three years, including articles and dissertations. Most of these works are in the context of years of research. These papers collaborate with the study of music form, pitch dimension, psychopatients, patterns, historical evolution, and so on. Because of the presentation time, Marx has picked a few papers to comment. He will talk about the relations to music form, historical evolutions and databases. As a professor of music theory, Marx will emphasize the relations between these papers and their music contributions. These papers apply multiple well-known algorithms or methods. Precision, recall, F1 score, frequency analysis, hypothesis tests, effect size, cluster analysis, dendrograms, key means, principal component analysis, entropy, support vector machine, Hydro Markov models, 
neural networks, convolutional and long short term memory, TFIDF distribution, term frequency inverse document frequency, latent semantic analysis, string alignment, string similarity, edit distance between strings and between trees, latent Dirichlet allocation, and callback library divergence. Marx thinks it is exciting to see computational musicology research about music form because it demands high-level music structure modeling. And this level is a challenge for the music information retrieval field. Three papers of this category propose algorithms or methods to analyze specific form issues, such as cadence, media, and fissura. Two other papers propose algorithms to identify sonata and rounded binary forms. In these cases, the authors have used different algorithm approaches. The authors of the sonata form paper have used hidden Markov models with the sonata sections as the model states, first theme, transition, the second theme, and so on and a list of present absent features as the input. They have used Mozart's string quartets as the database. The authors of the rounded binary form paper use edit distance and longest common substrings and subsequence algorithms to find the first phases reprise and two collections as datasets from songs and dances published in London between 1650 and 1770 and from popular classical violinist music. Marcus thinks it is really interesting to see how form is identified by different algorithms besides the complexity of sonata form in comparison to the rounded binary. Finally, Gotham and Ireland propose a human-readable form annotation syntax and an algorithm to measure the distance between forms. This algorithm basis is the edited distance between trees. This research seems to be very useful. It provides a tool to analyze the annotation subjectivity and the PC ambiguity. Also, we can use the algorithm to measure and cluster different music forms, such as Beethoven piano sonata forms. Moreover, as a professor of music theory, Marcus can imagine the application in the pedagogical context to measure the distance between the students' and teachers' analysis. Some papers give historical comprehension of music phenomena. Kahn and colleagues have approached instruments combinations from 1701 to 2000. The authors have used frequency analysis, clustering correlations and entropy as methods, and a sample of 180 pieces from 147 composers chosen for music guides as dataset. They have found interesting information such as the presence of the piano in the between 1950 and 2000 in the same proportion of the presence of harpsichord and baroque period. Marcus is not sure if the sample method is really appropriate because the used sample is very small. Fabian Moss has studied historical changes in tonality with a focus on the 19th century. This analysis occurs in micro, meso and macro levels and the macro level datasets comprise 2000 pieces comprising a historical range of approximately 600 years. The study methodology is diverse and provides insights into a quantitative analysis from a set of different perspectives, linking music theory, computational musicology, and modeling mathematics. These studies demonstrated the prominent role of fifths and major minor thirds as intervals between the most frequent notes. This fact motivated the modeling of the pieces as distributions based on tonnets. For this modeling, he proposed the tonal diffusion model, 
Tonal Diffusion Model, or TDM. He observed that the results follow the trends distributed along the tonnet axis and, as for the 19th century composers, an exploration of the axis of, the, of thirds, reaching even more distant regions in tonnets. He stated that the study does not fully support the narrative that the tonal system culminates in classicisms and dissolves in the 19th century, and with a vision of a paradigmatic changes formed by revolutionary leading to the new tonal systems. Marcus thinks this is the most comprehensive among the 30 works that he had read. In these papers, he had found references for 16 datasets. Kern scores, Music 21, ABC Beethoven, Troubadour Melodies Database, Cantus Database, Grego Base Corpus, Weinmar Jazz Database, RRGC Database, McGill Billboard, Spotify Metadata, Last FM Metadata, eChords, Ultimate Guitar, Cortified.net, Lot MIDI Dataset LDM, Cortified Annotator Subjectivity. Also, Marcus would like to mention some articles that he found interesting. Coops and colleagues have researched the subjective on chords analysis annotation and have presented methods and datasets to this task and have mentioned the impact on datasets that are considered ground truth. Klaus Friller has approached Miles Davis and John Contrain's solos transcriptions has corroborated the extroverted styles of Coltrane and introspective of Davis, has revealed a subtle difference. Coltrane prefers for thirds in arpeggios and semi-arpeggios, and Davis prefers to avoid thirds in comparison to Coltrane. Nobach and Conklin have investigated the pattern's interestness in the identification of characteristic and discriminating patterns. They used the Native American music by Francis Dainsmore as dataset and seven measures of interest. Typicality, utility, novelty, Laplace estimate, relative risk, IC++, and F1 score. They provided a systematic comparison of interestness that is useful in other studies. In this talk, I have commented some recent research related to computational musicology and listed some related algorithms in datasets. The computational musicology research has been made a great contribution to music theory in other areas. The historical evolutions, for instance, probably could not be done without the computer support. According to Enya Folk and colleagues, the investigation of musicology, musicological questions with computational approaches generates both new perspectives on old problems and new questions formulated in the context of musicological research. Finally, I invite all the students professors and researchers that are watching this table to check, check out these papers in databases, I'm sorry, datasets. Thanks. Uh, now we move uh, to our last uh, presenter, uh, Professor Jonatas Manzoli. He graduated in Computational Applied Mathematics uh, in 1983 and Composition and Conduct in 1987. He has a Master's Degree in Applied Mathematics, uh, both from Unicamp and a Doctorate, a PhD from University of Nottingham, 1993, on Music Composition. He is currently a full professor at the Unicamp Institute of Arts and Coordinator of the Interdisciplinary Center for Sound Communication, NICS, 
composer and mathematician. He researched the interaction between art and technology in music creation, music computing, and cognitive science. Welcome, Professor. Uh, your sound, uh, your mic is mute. Thank you very much for being, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, some of our people that I know previously. Uh, and I am really glad to be here. So also I invite some, some of my, my research colleagues like Mikhail uh, Antunes that is here in the room and also uh, Charles De Paiva that are people that have been collaborating with me in, in, the, in the research I'm developing at Nix. So um, my major concern today is really to try to describe to you how I have been connecting composition and musical analysis with all, with all the links and uh, with all the, the generalities of uh, that kind of connection. So actually I'm going to use uh, the idea that uh, um, what's important to me is that uh, music uh, composition, musical analysis could be connected by the idea of emergence in complex system. And I will try to show you how these two fields are, are connected in the work I have been developed at Nix and also with my colleagues and my students. So the first thing I would like to tell you is that very simple. So uh, uh, what, two properties of the the computer models that I think everybody knows, but it's, it's nice to tell you. So one property is interoperability, interoperability. That is the capacity of communicating and exchange information among model, models. So in such a way, we can exchange models from composition and also from, from analysis. That, that's one possibility. And the second one that's more related to creativity is the uh, computer models and models in general can, can have malleability. So that's the property of being molded or molded by deformation or by change. So that means it's, it's very nice when you apply this with creativity. So in that way, uh, I would say that some computer models with these properties, they would let us to combine these two things and it lead us to a creative expansion. That means can be creative in many senses in the, in the musicological, musicological field, also in the comp compositional field, also in both. So that means that's my major concern, try to, enhance the knowledge of creativity, not only in composition, but I'm thinking creativity is everywhere, is in, in musicology, is in a way you are inter interpreting a piece of music. We need creativity. So, and sometimes computer models help us to develop that creativity. So to help my, my definition of uh, malleability, interoperability, is that uh, quote from Pierre Boulez, so that I'm gonna read, oscillators, amplifiers, and computer were not invented in order to create music. However, in particular in case of computer, their functions are so easily generalized and so imminently transformable, transformable that there has been a wish to devise different objectives from the direct one, an accidental, conjunction will create a mutation. So maybe that's my, my role in life. I'm looking for mutations. I'm, I'm looking for hybrids. I'm looking for opportunities to, to use tools that maybe are applied to one, to one thing I, I'm going to use in another thing. So actually, um, um, basically my hypothesis, the major hypothesis of my dialogue is that music is a dynamic system. I, I would say, I would stay for a long time to explain what I mean by that, but simply it's because music is an evolution of structure in time. And, and the, the first thesis of my approach is it's possible to design computer models to generate such emergence in complex system. And the second thesis is there are spectral features of musical discourse that emerge in time. 
I don't think it's difficult to convince you about this. I think it's very natural in any kind of music, but especially in my case, I would like to study uh, that possibility in the field of electroacoustic music composition and also in live electronic music and sound max mass composition because I I think these kind of emergencies and complexes, they are there very much uh, showing that possibility so we can use computer models to, to help us to understand that. So uh, next, uh, so my, my, my central objective is to give the development of methodologies to describe and generate because I describe in analysis and generating in composition, that's that's emergence of spectral behavior in under the perspective of perception. As um, Professor Moreno already said, so we need to combine nowadays perception with musicology. So somehow the effect of music does in our, in our sense is very important. And you can have uh, speculations in, in perceptual fields and also neuroscience and other things. So uh, one of the books uh, I, when I wrote some a chapter is that book is called Computational Modeling of Mind and Music is a chapter over there. When I discuss, discuss it, it very much deep. So I'm going now only to introduce uh, some aspects of that research, but I invite you to, to have a look on this chapter. So, and also I, I, I left this reference of collaboration with my ex-students and ex-students and postgrad uh, collaborations. Uh, my, Mikhail that's here, uh, Charles is, is also here and Daniel is not here, but so I have been collaborating a lot with my students and that's give me the freedom to, to, ex to explore different ideas. But basically today I'm going to, to go a little bit more in the direction of the idea of emergency when we are using um, mass, music based on mass sounds or music based on the evolution of mass in, in time. For example, one good example that I'm going to use is ligate music, for example. So that means how can we uh, look for that? But before we go to the analysis, I'm going to play you a piece, an uh, installation of mine that's somehow explained my perspective in, in the computer uh, simulation. Have a look on this environment, on this installation. <laughs> It's very much what I would say I have in my mind many, many years ago when I was working in the electronic studio and I was working computer uh, generate music or even less, not using computer, using tapes and so on. I have in my mind some imaginations how the sound and the image I have about sound, they may be formed. So in 2015, I, I got to organize this, to develop this tool that is this environment when I can generate in real time and this kind of emergent patterns that audiovisual texture. So that texture that emerges with sound and image, it's very much connected with my idea of emergency and the idea of emergency that I have been work in analysis and in composition. So that's an example. Let's go to uh, uh, some examples in uh, electroacoustic music and sound mass composition. So basically we have been working with some computational tools for extraction. We call these tools as audio descriptors. descriptors. So uh, basically now working uh, with Mikael, so we are go a little bit deep in the use of descriptors that are connected to psychoacoustic. So not only having a look on the scriptures that describe the spectral behavior, but also that describe the spectral behavior connected to psychoacoustics, to, to how the sound is perceived. So um, one of the, the scriptures that we have been worked with is the bark coefficient. 
So that means the bar coefficient is a kind of spectrogram that's layered by the, the bark scale. So that means I'm not going to explain it in details, but basically you have a spectrogram that's divided by the bark scale. Uh, the second possible use is, is uh, the spectral irregularity. So if you are looking for music that's changing a lot, the spectral behavior is interesting to look how the spectral irregularity is transforming the music. So the spectral irregularity is very simple to define. So you take two windows in the spectral domain and you take the, diff the quadratic difference between them, you have a kind of measure so, uh, of that, that mag magnitude. So, and also one another one measurement that have been used uh, is the spectral change in, of loudness. So in that way, we are using the, the cal we calculate in the spectral and also you, we modulate, we, we multiply that spectral uh, energy by the flatter, flat, flatter Mansell curves. So in such a way, you have a kind of weight function that describes the loudness behave in the spectral. So having these tools and other ones, one, one of the things we are doing is, is develop a methodology for making analysis. So our methodology is very simple, ready to basic two steps. One step is the computational automatic segmentation. And the second step is the feature extraction using audio descriptors, the tools I have showed you. So, and the corpus of analysis that we're using is very much the digital audio files of electroacoustic music, or performance recordings, that's also digital audio files, of live electronic music or, or performance of music like uh, textural music or sound max, mass composition. So that's make the corpus of analysis. So basically the methodologies can be this, uh, explained this, by this diagram. So we develop a segmentation of the work taking some computer automatic uh, segmentation. This is the audio file. And after we, we extract some um, features, spectral feature connect to the perception or psychoacoustic uh, extraction. And after we can have curves that describe the behavior in time of such uh, features. And if we have the score, in, for example, if the music has the score, we can combine some results uh, from the, the score, some uh, structures from the score to help us to understand some features that we are, we are extracting from, from the audio file. So uh, to explain you, to give some examples, uh, the first one is that music of mine that's um, resonances for piano, uh, that's it's a music that was inspired by the Montserrat chain of mountains in Spain. And in that first analysis, I had uh, this luck a picture that describes the spectrum of the music in 3D. Sorry, let's go back. And suddenly I realized that the 3D spectrum, it looks very much with the chain of mountains uh, of, uh, well, that inspires me. So I was, my goodness, that, that's amazing. So I decided to not only to be amazed by the picture, but also try to try to understand how this behavior can be possible in the spectral domain. So in that sense, I analyze some, some uh, change in the piano score related to the kind of uh, uh, live uh, performance and I'm uh, sorry, live pro processing I was developing during the performance. So in this way, I make an analysis, for example, of a convolution of a sound. I have the piano original sound. I have the uh, filter sound and I have the result convolution. So I can have the spectrum. I can describe how these material are changing time. So by using the, the convolution theorem and by having a look on this, I could understand a little bit better how was the behavior of that such composition when it was played by a performer and, and also was transformed by, by the computer in real time. A second uh, 
idea we had developed. So uh, is a, a recent paper that we try to, to describe the idea that's the time, there's a time con continued emergence in the Latakushkin music. So for, for, for doing that, we took two very well-known works, the homenage to Joyce of uh, Luciano Bellio and Gesang by Stockhausen that many people know and everybody know, but we, despite we know that there's a lot of similarities between this music they are making for voice and so on, and they are from quite the same time, we try to show that a on the other hand, the time concept, the way the time emerges uh, in that two compositions is very different, but different from which perspective? From the perspective of complex dynamic system, we, we describe time as an emergent property of these two pieces. So for that, we using some um, ideas from the Gestalt theory. So we have we had to develop some plots that can give some patterns, time patterns that can help us to understand how time emerges in the evolution of this two piece. So to do that, we have a work with phase space plots, but phase space plots of the spectral centroid and spectral spread. So that means we we make these spectral plots in such a way that you can see the accumulation and how the behave of the patterns are accumulating time. As you can see, for example, the spectral centroid and the spectral spread in, in homenage to Joyce, a Joyce from Bellio, you can see this curve that evolves gradually in time. So you can see the spectral centroid in loudness has another behavior. So that means we can also have this, the same description of, about Gezang. So as you can see, the, the phase space plots are very different. So what, what is our hypothesis? The hypothesis is the distribution of energy in time give us the reference for the evolution of time so that the way you perceive time is related to the way the spectrum is behavior in time. So if, if you accept that hypothesis, so that means the perception of time is somehow related to distribution of energy in the spectrum. So that if you can, if you can describe the distribution of energy in time, you can also be able to describe the, the distribution of, of uh, the, the perception of time. So that was our aim. And as you can see here, we, we integrate all the sessions of the two works in, in, in that's two plots, and you can see that uh, somehow they are they have some similarities, but they are a little bit different. So that means that somehow prove our hypothesis that in terms of the way the energy is distributed in time and the time behavior of the energy give, gives different patterns. And because the energy produces different patterns, accumulate different patterns in time, we, we are saying that the way we perceive time in this two music is different. So a second, uh, a third example is the very recent paper I'm, I'm writing with uh, the, um, Mikael, and we are going to present it in ICMC 2002, is very much connected to a, a music that is very much well known is that music from Ligets, that, that uh, is this, the, con the continuum. So uh, I think I don't need to play, but I play only a bit to remind you. So So this is, that's very well known, but what's intriguing in this music and give us uh, the thesis of our analysis is the creation of continuous, uh, of a continuous through the fusion of several attacks of the harpsichord produce tension between continuity and discontinuity. Second thesis, a diffusion of harmonic structure emerges from the micro temporal manipulation. So that means how can you see that? We can listen to that. Anybody that has exposed to the, the ligates performs might see this kind of uh, emer emergency of a, a kind of diffuse harmony. So our aim is, was 
it might be possible to describe the, the, this diffusion of, uh, um, of harmony using some, uh, um, let's say, some audio descriptors related to psychoacoustic. Uh, so uh, in that sense, we are going to extract in perceptual features connected with the Ligit's uh, compositional perspective. So in this way, uh, we divide our analysis in two, in two parts. The phase, uh, phase one is the segmentation, okay? Second phase, we, we take the uh, features extraction. So the segmentation we're doing with a, a segmenter from Queens Mary Library. And we use the feature extraction from some descriptors that we have been developed at Nix and others from other libraries. So, and we end, uh, one of the, the result of our analysis is that segmentation, when you can see the distribution of energy in the bark scales, and also you can see that in time. So one minute, uh, let's go back. Uh oh, one minute, uh, okay. So, uh, um, so you can see that, uh, when you have a look on that, we can see that the segmentation uh, had this, this kind of behavior. The behavior is uh, originally, we have two sessions, one session of accumulation and another session of a filtering. So in that way, the spectral uh, en energy of this, uh, the energy of spectral is accumulating from the segments A to F and do have a spectral filter from, from segments from G to G to J. So the analysis reveals a complex profile of spectral irregularities. So basically, uh, mainly uh, provided or, or generated by the fr frequency beats, and this also by the emergence of differential sounds. So with these two uh, examples, we I have show you how that hypothesis of uh, analyzing music by the idea of complex dynamics and emergence is, is connected to our work. So now I will go back to the example of the composition. Actually, I will only give you a, another, um, I'm not going to explain because we don't have time anymore, but I'm only saying that this composition, the begin, it's, it's uh, the idea is to generate audiovisual texture of clouds of sounds and image, and the composer is improvised with compute in real time. So I have the computer, uh, um, I have the computer interface developing pure data, and using this interface, I can communicate my change, and and that leads the the computer to generate new audiovisual patterns. So, and have a look a little bit more at uh, one session of the work. You can, you're gonna see that there's a lot of uh, uh, old fashioned uh, synthesizer. Okay, uh, uh, we would say FM synthesis, we have additive synthesis and so on. So you can listen to that. So these are the base of, of the, the sound material. Opa. You can see also this natural and complex method. This is always generating real time. So, and the next and the last example is a, a piece for live electronics that's called transmigration. And in that music, I'm going to use that concept of emergency, connect to two, to two ideas, mediate the performance with a computer model. And in that case, the computer model is a Markov chain. And I'm using the Markov chain from the computer to give sounds for the, the musicians to improvise and also to change their relation in the, the environment, in the space. The general concept of this piece, so the performance space is there. 
So in the poetic disease, let's uh, talk about the human migration, birds migration. So that means make the space a representation of human migration, birds migration. And the composition is, is connected to the transformation of a dynamic system. I call this possible, that, that possibility of transformation, I call this a composition as an ecological niche, or say a space for ec ecological change or ecological dialogue. So I can see the sound space from the spaces that the sounds that the space generates. And also we have the, the way they interpret see the space. So the, by and combine these two things, uh, we can also use technology to make it, to capturing uh, what's going there. We can record in video, you can record this in three, uh, 316 video and so on, in such a way that that behavior that's emerged in that behavior of performance can be also, uh, let's say, can be also documented as, uh, as, um, as a performance, as a piece of, of music. So, and the basic ideas are, to use movement, encounter, and appropriation. Movement between the, the interpreters, encounter between sound and sound materials, and appropriation, appropriation of, of sound and materials. So in, in that way, we are going back to the original idea of the work that is the idea of human migration. We are talking about this very uh, deep crisis we are living now, uh, that's the migration in, in everywhere. We have these problems, and but using this music, also I'm trying to connect the migration with the idea of complex system. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this composition. Uh, one of uh, one of the parts. I invite you to to have a look on, on the on the web page so and you can see the full in, in my YouTube channel you can see the full work so to end I would like to say that every computer mod brings interpretations not only for the the writer of the computer program but interpretations in many sense uh, word word views in a small cosmology the creative application of computer models leads to an inexorable and inexhaustible exploration of representations, which belong to a unique universe of knowledge, the subject's conceptual space. The more concepts that inhabit this space, greater are the opportunities for invention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Monzoli. Uh, can you? Do you have any questions, uh, people from here? There's no question yet on YouTube. Let me just double check. No, not yet. We have a question maybe for Professor Monzoli. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone for the great presentations. Uh, I have a work that I will present tomorrow on the round table on music and probability that is about a uh, music emotion recognition. And we try to infer uh, this emotion from features extracted from the audio signal. 
but uh, it is quite well known in the literature that the acoustic features like limit of frequency and so on are not so representative of these response variables. So there is an on, some ongoing researches on more musical features, but I am not fully aware of more musical features than uh, these ones. I, I, I am uh, studying this research now. This is a new field of research of, of me. So if you can, or, or some other speaker, obviously can speak uh, a little about other features than acoustic ones, I will thank you very much. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I would say, Hugo, that we, we, we should divide the problem in two, in two aspects. We have the lower level description of uh, um, musical spectral behavior, that's or the, the things I showed you, and we have the high level description. When we are talking about emotions, emotions, humor, and so on, is a higher level, is a higher level of, uh, of modulation of the, our perception. So the, the things I showed you is much more connected to lower level. So psychoacoustics models, they take care about the lower level, that level that's connected to the cochlea uh, and so on. To go further, we need to study better how this signal goes to our brain. And also we have also concepts that might help us to understand what means uh, emotion, what, what means emotion in music. So one good example is the work of uh, David Huron. I think he, you are familiar with that. So Huron, he works up, he gave us the idea of anticipation. So for me, anticipation is a very basic behavior that can be connected to emotion in music. And for me also, we, we can use that to analyze electroacoustic music as well. I think we, and when you are you work with electroacoustic music, we are anticipating things. If you have a look in the way you are organizing sounds, so that means if you anticipate things with anticipation of structure, so that means you, we can apply also this high level of emotion in any kind of musical analysis. So, but you have to divide your analysis. The analysis I showed to you. Uh, in my talk today is the psychoacoustic analysis. I have other works when I am anal analyzing the higher level. The, in that uh, book I show you in the beginning of my talk, there are uh, other papers and other research that are in charging of make this connection because that connection between the lower level and high level, it's not an easy one. It's a very complex one. So that means there's no uh, answer for that, actually. So we're not going to describe it. We're going to, let's say, to see how we can understand it better. Uh, in, in the literature, I think for me, the most uh, simple way also of understanding these things is about, is connected to the Gestalt theory. So I have shown you, for example, how I understand uh, continue, ligates continue under the Gestalt theory. So I can see the way the patterns, and not, not, not only myself, there are other works that also describing the auditory scenery of, of uh, uh, ligates continue in terms of Gestalt. So that means we, have, we are inside of this new area. So everybody's learning. <laughs> If, if I can add, uh, can, can I add something, uh, Jonathan? Because uh, uh, this brings me back also so to the to what I, I, I was showing. Uh, I, I think expectation, in fact, is really an essential point in uh, not only in, in the perception we have of tonal music, but uh, in all kind of music. When when we want to distinguish between organized music and just noise, uh, expectation is a is a is a major feature. And uh, uh, what we are uh, trying to study in the, in, with respect to the tonnets and the generalization of the tonnets in, in all possible decomposition of the plane is precisely the way in which a given chord is expected as the most uh, kind of coherent, logical one 
after a, uh, a sequence of, of, of code in a given uh, harmonic progression. And this is something which is studied uh, also in neuroscience uh, by colleagues in, in Dijon, uh, for example, Emmanuel Bigan and Barbara Tillman. They are, uh, they are kind of um, uh, pointing out that the, there is an implicit learning in the way in which uh, we we understand, for example, some musical situation. So the, the, there is an implicit way of processing the musical information, which has to be uh, kind of rediscovered in, a, in, in a experimental psychological uh, tests. So uh, th this is just to, to make a link, uh, uh, a bridge between what, what you have shown, Jonathan, which is much more uh, kind of complex uh, systems, a dynamical system and audio uh, perspectives. And what I've been down in mathematics in symbolic musical representation and uh, symbolic music information research. Uh, and I, I think the, this fact of, uh, for example, the, this notion of expectation and violation of expectation as a way of producing emotion uh, this is also something which is very known in musicology. Uh, Leonard Mayer, for example, uh, really postulated uh, in, in his books this this very idea of the the emotion as uh, kind of provoke, kind of determined by the frustration of a, a given expectation. And I mean, there are there are a lot of also philosoph philosophical uh, ramification with Husserl and all the phenomenology. Phenomenology. I I think we are. Uh, we, we have examples in both audio and symbolic representations of these kind of futures, of the validity of these futures for, for un better understanding uh, the musical process. Yeah, th this is something I just wanted to, to add. Great. Uh, Thanks uh, a lot for the answers, very enlightening. And thanks again for the great uh, presentations. Yes, we have a, a YouTube question uh, by Rodrigo Furma. He asks, I don't know if it's a question for uh, Professor Manzoli or for everybody. He asks, on technical specifications, I'm a tech guy, what's being used to generate real-time video? It's the processing language. I would, uh, it's very much uh, simple, Rodrigo, I'm using uh, PG, uh, pure data, and I'm using the library gem. So, uh, and uh, I'm not drawing, I'm not generating structure. I have seed structure. I have lines, dots, and small triangles. And the whole thing you see is, uh, is an emergent structure. How I do it, I use an algorithm that's called uh, Boyd algorithm. Boyd is an algorithm that describes the behavior of uh, animals and also so in swarm behavior. So I assign the Boyd algorithm relates to the sound synthesis process. By having a dynamic system that describes the birds flying, I make my music and my audiovisual flying. So because of it also, I, I present the last piece. In the last piece, I have these uh, boids in, in nature, in the migration of birds, that there, there's a connection. And I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> but uh, in general sense is that I'm not going processing, I'm going, I'm using a gem, uh, uh, a visual, uh, uh, a gem library from pure data. And, uh, and the algorithms are controlled by the behavior of the boids. Okay, thank you, Professor. Any more questions from, uh, from the room here? Comments? Uh, uh, Professor Andreat, I have a quick question. That, uh, that application, is it available to everybody through uh, uh, this, this, uh, repositories of... Uh, is an uh, open source. Uh, open source, web, okay. open source web application. So the best way to do is, is just go to my web page and, and there is a, a link on the uh, just tonnets huh? and, and you click and you and you are uh, in the in the GitHub uh, 
kind of an environment where we have put the code and, and everything. If, if people have the possibility to, but it's not really the time to, to travel, but in Heidelberg, in the Heidelberg uh, Foundation, uh, Heidelberg Laureate Foundation conceived a, um, a big uh, uh, exhibition, which is called Math La La Lab, Mathematics and Music Exhibition. And this, uh, the, this environment, together with all the environments which have been conceived for this exhibition, uh, is available uh, in the, so the exhibition uh, shows a lot of uh, interesting uh, computer-aided uh, environments and all uh, share this same idea of, of uh, being uh, uh, totally open. Huh? So the, you, can, you, can, uh, you can take the code basically and uh, can develop your own uh, module for, for the for the for the tonnets. And this is something which 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 we are trying to keep uh, uh, updated by integrating not only the tonnets as a, as a, the space that uh, I have uh, presented, but also different geometric representation, different graphs uh, like uh, uh, cube dance, uh, for example. If we, you want to. Uh, just analyze uh, harmonic paths in major, minor, augmented triads, or other uh, more sophisticated representation like k-nets or poly k-nets. Uh, is, is, this is our work we are doing with uh, Andre Harisman, uh, Carlos Sagon, and uh, Alexander Popov. The idea is really to have this environment as an open space in which you can put different modules and analyze the music according to the, the way in which you want to focus uh, on some particular features of the musical representation. Great. Uh, thank you. If there's no more questions... Uh, uh, I want oh. to make a question for Morin. Morin. Sorry to, to yeah. uh, 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 it's it's not a question. I have I have saw your your concert when you came some years ago here in Brazil, and I I was very pleased to listen to that. But I, I have a a small observation that I, I want to play with you about this idea of anticipation. Don't you think in your tone acts when you play one thinks that is major, you transform to minor, and so on by the idea of you you play with ambiguity because you talk about duality but in certain in certain aspects you are you are playing with ambiguity so somehow something that looks like in this way suddenly happens in another way don't you think this ambiguity is very much a pleasure of listening to pop music or, or, or even to listen to Brazilian music, because the harmony of Brazilian music is somehow, it looks like it's gonna be there, but it's not there. And, and by not being there in, in, in sense of cadence, you're playing with ambiguity for the listener. So by doing that, playing with this kind of uh, impossibility of the possibility, <laughs> and it's a funny way you were saying that, people feel pleased about that. How, how do you think about this? Uh, I have a, a very, very uh, kind of nice anecdote because I, I had the possibility to, to share the stage uh, in Italy with, a, with a, somebody who really I, I love is Paolo Conte, is a great uh, chansonnier, a great uh, musician. And uh, when I saw some uh, analysis of his music based on the tonnets, uh, I, 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 I've seen immediately he was very skeptical about, uh, about the, the fact of uh, putting the music into a geometric space. But when I analyzed some, some kind of more sophisticated uh, music, like uh, uh, Rosetta, for example, of the beginning of, of the 30s, uh, in which you have kind of jazzy uh, kind of sonorities. And then I, I, I did this dual operation. Uh, suddenly uh, he found very interesting the process. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it's the same for rich kind of music, like, like a Brazilian, Cuban, Brazilian music, uh, the, the jazz standards uh, can be really transformed in, into this uh, dual operation 
by really playing with the ambiguity. As you said, uh, I, I perfectly agree. Uh, this is a way of, of producing something new uh, by using the same material, but uh, in a kind of, in a, in a way which is unexpected. And, uh, uh, and since uh, we are uh, always kind of trying to anticipate in our mind what, uh, what, what comes uh, next, uh, the fact of having this violation of the expectation, but in a way which is not noisy, uh, totally noisy, not confusing, it is really kind of coherent, uh, makes a kind of, uh, I would say, another degree of organization uh, within a piece of music. And uh, this is something I would like to uh, kind of uh, try to understand much better from a cognitive point of view, and maybe use really in order to exploit these techniques in, in pop, writing uh, something that I'm doing with the, with the students in the University of Strasbourg, which, which are kind of now uh, uh, capable of uh, composing uh, potential hits by using uh, geometry and, uh, and the topological structures instead of just uh, uh, the common music theoretical kind of uh, recipe. But I mean, we, we need much more time in order to really obtain a uh, a hit <laughs> someday. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to make a joke. Everybody knows that I love to make a joke. So the idea is uh, you give the ice cream, but you don't do the ice cream. <laughs> you only pretend <laughs> it's sweet, but it's not there. <laughs> Okay, uh, we will have in 30 minutes the first uh, concert uh, uh, of the, uh, the Congress. So um, I will ask you to stay a little bit more after I um, close the transmission so we can say goodbye properly. Um, so I think, uh, Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel, I think we could end uh, the transmission now in YouTube, right? Yeah, we, we can end, and the, the video for the the concert will be a different link. So if you're watching this on YouTube, just stay here, and probably YouTube will notify you about new link. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. It, um, yeah. So uh, the the concert is uh, six p.m. Okay. Um, have works by uh, Daniel Almada. I have a work too. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much, and um, I'll ask you to stay a little bit more after um, uh, I close the transmission, okay? Yeah, stop the recording. Okay.